Hey, hey Renee. Hi, Josh. How are you? I am good. Good. Yeah. Um, so this is our wrap up video mm -hmm. for our Zohar class. Our first and Zohar class. Our first Zohar class. Is there going to be another one? Who knows? Mm. <laughs> um, our last class was not recorded, so it's not widely available because of sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave me, you know, it, it actually gave me a different perspective on the Zohar and um, I think that, you know, I still feel like maybe it's a book that we shouldn't be reading. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I think honestly, in some ways, like there was a way to teach the class in which I just decided to like take snippets or something, which are like cute and fun. But what I wanted to do was I really wanted to try to introduce people to what the Zohar is in its, in its weight. Like it is, there's a reason, I mean, there's a reason it's called Zohar Kaidash. Like it is a different book. It is something that is not like, like it has a, it has a sanctity to it, has a, it has a, has a, a holiness to it. I that, feel, yeah. yeah, keep going. No, that's, you know, like in terms of like it giving access to a, a, a an intimate perspective. Yeah. On God. It's not just I, theoretical. It's like, it's a, it's a portal to something else. Yeah. What I really felt like after the only way I can really... I mean, there's a reason, sorry, there's a reason the Zohar was immensely controversial. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it was giving access to something in print in a sense that was only supposed to be done through a teacher student relationship kept in these close quarters. Right. So the, for the book to kind of put it, I mean, again, in this metaphorical symbolic elusive kind of way, but put it all out there. Yeah. It's a sea change. Yeah. Um, I really felt, feel like the Zohar is almost just, is almost like a diary. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, cause it keeps using the word secret, like, mm -hmm. you know, all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And like, it's so intimate mm -hmm. and it's about these rabbis just having these experiences with God mm -hmm. and it's such an intimate relationship and they wrote it down mm -hmm. and it's kind of like you know if your brother had a diary right you know if your brother was had you know had a girlfriend right. kept a diary yeah. and you knew where it was hidden would you read it right no that's that's such a good that's such a good metaphor Renee. that's like my perspective on why I think we shouldn't maybe not be reading it because it is well, so I mean, personal it, it was written and it was published so the intention was for it to be read, right? Like it's not, it's, I mean, listen, on one hand, I love that metaphor and it's like a really great way. I mean, it's like, yeah, like the text, you know, like one of the mini texts that I mentioned is called Sifred Tzniusa, right? Which means the hidden secret book. And yeah. like, yeah, it's the book you keep under your bed because it's where you put your secret hidden thoughts in it and no one should read it, right? Exactly. But, but it's more like, it's more like you have a secret book and you share it with your best friends. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like the intimate secrets you share with people that you love and trust. Yeah. Right? So that's, I think, so like the Zohar was published, but I think one of the things I really wanted to, and that's the reason I did the last class and it's a secret class, right? was because like, A, I wanted to, in a sense, create the atmosphere that I think the Zohar deserves. One of trust and one of closeness and intimacy and one of, uh, of secrecy. It's like, this is a secret that yeah. uh, 15 of us shared. Yeah. And that's no. something very, that's something like, that's something not non-trivial. Yeah. And I think honestly, the truth is like, I've, I felt that tension about, that's why like, I kind of did more of like the nigla, right? The exoteric parts of the Zohar first in a sense, like the stuff that's, you know, and the only last one did I really get to something like, did I get something that's like, it shows why, like it shows why this text has that kind of relationship around it. And like, that's, I think that's the right way to learn Zohar is like hopefully please god when the pandemic you know is over uh we can meet in person and we can sit yeah. at night candles right and like tell secrets to each other right we can like have this safe space in which we can explore this text 
um, but in a way that respects what it's trying to do. Um, sorry, there's something uh, happening with my phone. Um, yeah, I feel like um, people are probably maybe watching this like, I wonder what their last class was about. Like and that was so intense secret but like <laughs> secret. honestly just... I thought it was like ra rated like rather PG it was no I didn't no 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 it wasn't so, a thing. it wasn't so like no. er erotic or anything um but uh but it was a very interesting uh, I guess metaphor that the rabbis were using in terms of their relationship with the Torah and God so um um, yeah, anyway. I mean, and also, like, you know, the one class I want to do is, like, class on liturgy and the like, and in terms, especially about, like, uh, so Lechad Odi, right? The prayer that was written in 16th century Tzvas by Shlomo Levi Alkabetz mm -hmm. has a metaphor for Shabbos coming in and it being a wedding procession, right? Now has a whole, like, now you see where he's getting that symbolism from. It's this, like, Zoharic theology of love. Right, which all of the Kabbalists after the Zohar especially are really drawing from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for those of us, for those people who did not tune in on our last class, what just, can you just say, like tell the, sure. the part that we learned so that, well, you I'll, know. I'll give the Rashi Tevos, yeah. But again, like I actually don't want to get too much into it because I really do think it should only be disclosed in the correct circumstances. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. So that, I mean, I, that I really mean it. Like, I mean, when we're doing Kabbalah, there's a way to teach Kabbalah like the Kabbalah Center, which has a Masora, right? It has like its own tradition, you know, from um, from the you know students of the students of Sulam, right? A very important Kabbalist. Right? The Kabbalah Center has like some yichus to it. Um, what it's done with it, that's a different question. But um, but its interests is kind of like Chabad in a way, in the sense of like via futsu, right? You want to spread it all around. You want to publish it, promulgate it. You want to make sure everyone gets access to secrets because it's going to bring Mashiach. That's, that might be true, but like, the problem is like, once you tell a secret, it's not a secret anymore. You yeah. can't tell a secret, right? The only way you can tell a secret and, and have it be a secret is for the other person to keep it a secret. So I think that's part of the, so I, I, I've been like, I, I tried in some ways to teach that tension in the Zohar that on one hand, right, we have the, the crying of Rashbi saying like, it's only until this moment that this wasn't able to be revealed, but now I can reveal it. So Zohar is very daring. It's very revelatory. It's telling the stuff. It's giving you access to the secrets for the first time in print, right? Whereas usually Ramban, right? Nachmanides in his Torah commentary says, oh, here's the Alderach Emes. Here's like the secret truth. And I'm just going to hint at it because really I'm going to give a hint and you really know what I'm talking about because you've learned it from your teacher. But it doesn't mm -hmm. write it in print. But the mm -hmm. Zohar is pushing and saying, I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm going to open up a little bit more. I'm going to give you what that kind of experience feels like, what it looks like. So mm -hmm. that's on one side. The Zohar is a daring, revelatory, like a futsu text. But the other side of the Zohar is that it still doesn't refer to the things it talks about directly, right? It doesn't use the word spherot. It uses midos. It uses yami. It uses all these other terms, right? So it still requires some kind of sense of you being inducted into this community to know what it's talking about. It's mm -hmm. not, gonna, it's not going to, but I mean, the truth is honestly, it's like, it's like, you can't describe what a relationship feels like. You can't like, you say like, oh, I love my spouse because they are like a kind and generous person and they are nice to dogs and like, and all this stuff. And it's like, that doesn't ca like, yeah, sure. But like, your male, you know, the male, your male carrier is also a kind and generous person who's nice to dogs, but you don't love them, right? Like you don't, you can't explain something that personal. It cannot be explained. It cannot be universalized, right? All what the Zohar also is trying to do is actually induce an experience. And the experiential side of it, in a sense, gets e like undercut or like evacuated if all I'm doing is just telling you what the Zohar says. Right, it's not the Zohar <laughs> isn't a bo a book of doctrines. The Zohar is a portal, right? It's a lens mm -hmm. into something, um, and it gives you access to symbols and ways of understanding God and the divine human relationship in ways that are surprising, controversial, challenging, inspiring, beautiful all these things, but they're only able to be taught in the right context. So the Rashi Tables of the last class was that it was a very rich metaphor, 
mushal, right, a parable used in the Zohar to describe what the relationship is between someone devoted to Torah and the Torah for person and God, in which the Torah is, in which it's really about the relationship between those two members of that, of that, mm -hmm. of that connection, in which the Torah is revealing itself progressively to the person. But it's, it's metaphorized in this metaphor of this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets to, but the challenge in it, like that's very simple in a sense. Yes, the relationship between you and a text. That's not that hard to think about. But it really goes deeply into the intimacy of what that relationship entails. It uses like the, you know, the human metaphorical symbol and goes deep into like what that, what those implications are. So you said it was like PG, even though like kind of the way I, I said, it was like, oh, I'm gonna keep it secret because it's more explicit. But like the truth is like Zohar isn't explicit in that kind of way, but it's serious, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the way you wouldn't, it's like the way you, you would show like your love letters to your best friend, right? Because you're so excited and you trust them and they get it, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't show your love letters to, if, to show your love letters with like with your spouse or something right or your your boyfriend or whatever it is um to like some rando right some random person you meet that actually shows in a sense that like what you care more about is telling than it than you care about what's the what's in the letters right well you want you want to show off in a way you just want to kind of tell somebody but to show that you really take the what's in the substance of those letters what they what they entail what they what they signify seriously to treat them preciously Right, that means that you're only going to really show them in the right context. Mm -hmm. I think a good um, <clears throat> like challenge, or I guess in, I don't know what you would call it, like incentive, would be is if like we would all write our own Zohars. Like, you know what I mean? We should mm -hmm. all maybe try you know, maybe not writing it down in a diary, but like thinking of how our, you know, what is our relationship with God? And oh, yeah, like we would all have our own Zohar if we actually sat down and tried we'll to, we'll something, to, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, so yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think one of the things I want to try to push about the Zohar is that it's not just like a record of spiritual experiences. It is like, it's not just something that like, ha that people just kind of happen to, right? These are actually results of practices results of practices and traditions of what it of what like these types of mystical contact with God look like, right? The visions, the imagination that that entails and the specific dynamics, you know, through reading the Torah that we've learned about. But that being said, it, it does also seem true that there's a body of literature we don't have access to anymore. You know, there's Gershom Sholem in his book, um, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism. Um, said, you know, something surprising about Jewish mysticism when compared to Islamic and especially Christian mysticism is that there's a lot less first person narratives. And that's true, right? There's very few texts in which it's like a, a mystical diary, like actually a mystical diary. So Avram Abulafia has some first person texts we have, we, that have survived. There's others he wrote that we don't, ha that, that were lost, it seems. We don't have those. There's fragments of a mystical diary by, um, by Yosef Demin, uh, by Yitzchak Demin Ako, um, Isaac of, of Acker, in a book called Oats Rosa Chaim, which is studied by Eitan Fishbane in this book as Light Before Dawn. So he was a 13th, he was a 14th century Kabbalist, one of the few, 14th century is kind of like a dead century for Kabbalah for whatever reason. Um, there's Ma, there's the, um, Yosef Karo has um, his contact he had with his angelic visitor called the Magid. So you wrote, there was a book called Magid Mesharim, but it's a very like corrupted and edited book. So it's unclear how like authentic it is. And um, Chaim Vital, um, Isaac Luria's main disciple, he actually had a mystical diary called Sefer Chazionot, the Book of Visions. Um, and that actually is translated by Morris Firestein in a book called Jewish Mystical Autobiographies, part of the Paulist Press series. Um, it exists. Uh, so, so these are all uh, these are account? all these are all texts we have access to, but compared to like Christian mysticism, which is almost entirely in the first person, right? Like Teresa of Avila, Juan de la Cruz, right? Like all of, like the main books of Christian mysticism are first person narratives. They are mystical diaries. So why is it, says Sholem, that we have that most of the most of Jewish mysticism is stuff more like the Zohar or more yeah. like books of like theory, 
right? Like party ceremonium. Like why is it more academic, theoretical, you know, than it is experiential in first person? And he says like, oh, it's because actually like it's unclear if it's even based in an experience. Maybe it's actually based in like a mystical style of interpretation. So actually like there isn't really a mystical experience. There was a reaction to Sholem in the generation after him by Moshe Edel and others. And which is no, 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 actually the Zohar and other texts are hidden experiences, that they're actually based in experiences that the mystics who wrote them had, but they're encoded and kind of like, you can only kind of see them in a hint. So in a sense, you have to like read them as a mystical text to figure out the ways in which the, the, the experiences are secret. So especially with reading the Zohar, that's been a very influential take, right? The Zohar is a deeply influ like a experiential text, but it's put in the mouths of these rabbinic characters. It's it, these, you know, these visions that are described are ones that the writers of the book had and they're just kind of putting it, you know, they're putting it in this kind of narratival form. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. So, right. So, so, but also there seems to be other examples in which, especially in Sfas, for instance, like mystics were encouraged to write down what they were experiencing in the Hasidic movement. People were encouraged to write down what they were going through. So I would, I mean, ultimately I would agree with you, Renee. I think that that's a wonderful takeaway from this class to give credence to our experiences. Cause one of the things I, I was trying to encourage was that like the Zohar is encouraging us to pay attention to what it means to interface with reality, right? Pay attention mm -hmm. to what it's like to connect with the world in that kind of way to connect with God. But I also want to say, like, we should also have the anava, we should have the humility of, like, there's, like, there's us writing about, like, us reflecting on our experiences, which is a wonderful thing to do. And then there's the Zohar, which is, which is the product of, like, a lifetime work of, like, building up those types of, like, daring ventures, right, into the heart of existence itself, right? So we have yeah. access to the Zohar, and God willing, we can, we can reach, like, the hem of its garment one day, you know? But it takes, but it, no, it takes, it takes a real, you know, devotion. It takes a real commitment to yourself. And that's not something I have, right? I, I, I just want to be clear about my position. Like, I'm a student of these, of this material. I'm somebody who believes in it, in like, I believe in its value. I find it immensely inspiring. I think it's beautiful. I think it's, it's unfortunately undertaught in the Jew, especially in like the Frum community. I'm like, part of my mission is to try to give more access in a serious way to people like, and not just dismiss it as like hippie nonsense. Like there's like real serious stuff to get from this. It's like, it's a real body of work. Mm -hmm. But like, I also like, I also try to be very clear. Like I don't present myself as having authoritative access to it. Like I'm not part, of, I don't have a master, right? I'm a Ronin. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a masterless samurai wandering the thing. So like, <laughs> I know there are people out there who still do have a real Masora, like they are in the tradition. There is the um, Yeshiva Beit El, still in, still in fun it's still functioning in Jerusalem, founded in the 18th century um, by uh, Shalom Sharabi. And it is still perpetuating like the Lurianic style of Kabbalah, like in, you know, like still kind of going or, um, or, um, um, Ishmael Morgenstern, the uh, Leshem Shavu um also very important Kabbalist. So, like people are, you know, it's not a, it's not a dead tradition. It's not just Hasidism. There are like, like Kabbalists out there who are still keeping it going. Yeah. I think. Um, have you seen that the new Disney movie called Soul? No, I have not. Is it a Kabbalistic text? No. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, but it's it's such a good movie and it's like you know the pixar style like if you like the pixar movies um but there's this character in the in the in the movie who can who is who is like on earth but is able to connect and even function in like this the intermediate world and it's so funny because he's like this hippie guy <laughs> who like sits on the corner of a downtown Manhattan street, you know, he's just like sitting there, you know, yeah. in his, like, you know, in his trance and he's like, you know, doing stuff in the other world, but physically mm -hmm. he's still here on earth. And I think that like when people think of Kabbalists, that's what they think of, you know, like somebody who's like sitting there and connecting with the other, mm. you know, <laughs> with a different on a different plane but. well we did see an example of that and remember in the first class of like oh yeah if you want to like if you want to have this trippy mystical experience you like okay you like fast you sit yourself down in a room you put your head between your knees and like you see what happens <laughs> yeah yeah 
Uh, but anyway, it's a really cute take on like mm-hmm. these mystical, what mm-hmm. a, a mystical person is or, but um, I have to say the last class I found, I found very, not, not like all those Zohar classes actually, um, some of them I found a little difficult and mind bending, but the last one found it a little bit validating. If that's, I don't know if anybody else in the class had that experience. Drop a line I mean, in the comments. Yeah, I mean, I like it's good to know that other people have had a similar experience or that have experienced their relationship with Torah in the in the same way. I would maybe describe it a little bit differently, but um you know like the metaphor was true so at least for me so i think it's interesting i think in a way like one of the ways i try to teach not this about me but like one of the ways i try to teach is is i want i don't try to push things as like this is how you what you must believe but rather like i want to widen the framework in terms of like what's out there that's part of like an authentic jewish tradition so that when people see this stuff, they do feel validated. Like, yeah, like my intuitions, it's, it's not like being Jewish is this like one specific way, one specific way. Like that, that yeah. so many ways of thinking about Torah. And so like teaching about the different, you know, even in Kabbalah, there's a zillion ways inside of Kabbalah. So to find, yeah, to yeah. find the ways in which your intuition, you know, it's particular to you, but it's also resonating with something beyond you as well. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I think that's something that every Jew, I really do think every Jew should feel that. Yeah. It was a great class. So thank you very much. Such a pleasure. Was there anything else you- you, I'm I'm sad, I'm like, I don't have an excuse to learn Zohar every week. (laughs) I I have to keep, I'm gonna keep it going. Um, Well, listen, more more classes soon. Please drop, you know, drop me an email, drop some ideas in the comments of what you wanna do next. We have some idea of maybe doing some rabbinic agatata. Um, There's also the Omer period coming up. So we can also maybe think about doing some Midos work or some Spiro, you know, some like Kabbalistic work in terms of Spiros Omer. There's a lot of stuff out there. That would be cool. Um, So, I mean, you know, give me, give me, help me narrow down what my research is going to look like. (laughs) Okay. Um, But just all, I want to also, if you just make sure that we have what we need in hand, I also have like a a bibliography I can send out to, which I'll send to you, Renee. And we'll do it in the video. Um, but I just want to kind of give just gesture to some books that may be for people okay. who want to continue in their Zohar learning. So this is the standard um, edition of the Zohar that most people, that I think most people take. So it is based in the Mantua printing. It is the Masad Rav Cook version of the Zohar. It comes in three volumes. And then there's also two volumes, one of Tikkunei Zohar with the Bahir and the other one of Zohar of Hadash. Um, so this is, this is what it looks like. It's pretty all the stuff you can you can find in forum stores. This is um if your if your Hebrew is good, this is called Mishnah Zohar, the teachings of the Zohar. It is a thematic anthology of Zohar, so it's the different ideas of the Zohar grouped in topics. So out of order, but reordered uh, in terms of theme um, by Yishayahu Tishbi, who was a colleague of Gershom Sholem's. Um, it's also in English. It's a book called The Wisdom of the Zohar, Isaiah Tishbi, and translated by David Goldstein in three volumes. So this is in two volumes, if you can find it in Hebrew, if you want to work on your Hebrew. It's beautiful Hebrew. But if you want to do it in English, it also exists in English called um, The Wisdom of the Zohar. So that's especially great if you want to like learn, if you want an access to the Zohar, and it's like, okay, what does Zohar think about people? What does Zohar think about holidays, right? What does Zohar think about this? So that's, that's a great way to see kind of some hot, um, some good hot topics. Um, this is the one volume of the fully translated in English edition of the Zohar. There's an earlier translation published by Sencino Press, but it was very edited down, very bodlerized, cleaned up. You know, a lot of the scandal <laughs> stuff that we looked at in the last class got like kind of schmiced out. So this is the full edition of the Zohar. It is the product of a critical reconstruction of the text um, by Daniel Matt and his team of scholars. Um, Daniel Matt um, had previously written a one volume, kind of like, you know, again, like kind of a anthology selection of texts from the Zohar. This was part of the Paul's Press series, which I had mentioned before. The same one that came out with the Jewish mystical autobiographies. It's like a whole spiritual mysticism publisher, all kinds of mysticism. Um, so this is a wonderful book. 
it's, che it's very it's cheap you know you can find it's great it's it's a little bit outdated in terms of its framing its historical framing but it's you know this is like the book that kind of sparked matt's um larger work he got noticed by this and then it, this was literally a patronized work by the pritzker the same family that is currently the governor of illinois um big rich family um and so they patronized this work it was basically like him working on it for 15 years maybe of his life um and him and, and a couple other scholars who did the kind of the back half of the uh, the back last of the volumes but this is i mean matt's translation was a constant companion of mine he's a poet and a scholar like it's an astoundingly good piece of work it's something that translates the czar and also doesn't lose its spirit with also worth noting immense like half of this is notes and it's all the different like midrashic texts and precedents and scholarly works and stuff it's a really it's really worth getting um so it's called the zohar the, Stan uh, the pritzker edition it's published by stanford <laughs> university press um if you're looking for uh historical works and the like um so i, I was trained in the academy i think maybe um you know it's going to mean it's going to expose you to a more of a historical approach to things less of let's say like a uh room approach to things but whatever i don't think that one precludes the other i i believe in the zohar very 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 much and i also like have a historical relationship to it i don't think the two contradict each other uh but this is this is uh, gershom sholem's masterwork uh you know one of his masterworks uh, it's called major trends in jewish mysticism chapters four and five three and four four and five are five and six Chapters five and six, or the lectures five and six, are on the Zohar, and um, and it's a great, you know, one volume, very dry, very dry. It's, he was German. What are you gonna do? But, um, <laughs> great notes in the back too, especially with little great passages. Um, I, I can rant about Sholem for a long time, but I mean, it, it, one of the greatest geniuses of Jewish scholarship of all time, all time. Um, and last but not least, I'm not even sure this is last. Um. Yehuda Liebes also has a uh, volume that's called Studies in the Zohar, in which he has his theory of how the Zohar happened, and he kind of has this idea that Kabbalists in the 13th century kind of like spiritually identified with the rabbis of that, or like in the Zohar, and that kind of has his theory of like how it came together. But it kind of helps bring out that Zoharic literature. That's not just a book; it's that there's a whole Zoharic thing happening. Oh, I see. With a whole uh -huh. bunch of people in that in the 13th okay. century Spanish context. Um, Liebes, great scholar. He wrote a, uh, you know, if you want to follow up, if your Hebrew is up there, it's not an easy essay, but he's got an essay called Zohar of the Eros, Zohar and Eros, um, which is an incredible piece of work. Um, really beautiful, beautiful essay about, yeah, about like the theology of love in the Zohar. Gorgeous essay. Um, let me just think of just other books behind me that might be helpful about Zohar stuff. Um, if you want to look at if you want to if you want to look at Edel, this was kind of the book that launched Edel's history it was kind of his like sholem takedown book but it's better than that but a lot but a lot of it has to do with the zohar it's called kabbalah new perspectives and um there are there's a couple of few books actually that came out recently just on the zohar which are helpful um one is arthur green's uh called introduction to the zohar and it was originally an expanded version of the introduction to the series but it was published in its own slim paperback volume, really worth reading. Um, there was a book that came out recently, Nathan Wolski, who was one of the translators in that project, wrote a book called, I forget what his book is called, um, but he wrote a, a nice introductory book to the Zohar. And um, Eitan Fishbane, who wrote the book about Isaac of Acker, he mm -hmm. also wrote a book recently about Zohar as literature that came out and it's long, but it's, it's beautiful um it's a really lovely book it's not cheap but if you can find it from a library or something um really worth looking at uh and last this is actually not least um uh, this is but it is last is um a wonderful book that i had mentioned in the in one of the classes that i only have in hebrew but people should find it in english because it does exist in english um, called uh, oh, The River Flows from Eden by M Malila Helner Ashed. It's published also by Stanford University Press um, about Zohar language and experience. I think it's my favorite study of the Zohar. It is just, she, I studied, I had the privilege to study with her in Jerusalem. She's an incredible person, an incredible scholar, and her writing is just 
gorgeous. So if your Hebrew's up there, read it in Hebrew because her Hebrew is beautiful. And if not, the English translation is also wonderful. Um, is there one more in me? What's the other book? I that think if you put it in, like if you put it in. Yeah, no, I have, I have a bibliography, so I'm okay. sorry, it's already written up. Um, okay, so we'll make sure to put it in the, in the, can we attach it to the comments or to send it in an email? Yeah, yeah, no, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to this video. Probably we don't need to talk about this on the video. Yeah. Um, so, oh no, last one I want to say is also I have it only in Hebrew, but it's also in English. There's a guy in Israel called Boaz Hus, who actually has a book about how the Zohar, like a publishing history of the Zohar, and it's really interesting. Um, it's called Kizor Harakia, like the radiance of the sky, which is actually from the Pasuk we, we looked at in the first class. Yeah. Um, uh, I forget what it's called in English, but there's an English translation of it as well. His name's Boaz Hus, and it's about how the Zohar became a book. So that's really interesting and like kind of the way that people reacted to the Zohar. Um, it's, it's really neat. So that's, it's definitely worth checking out if you, your interest is like kind of, if you're interested in like history of the book, which is cool stuff. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. Ah, so fun. Okay. Well, you know, again, ta chaze, go and see, go and validate, go and intuit, go get in touch with what we're experiencing. And um, I'll see you all very soon. Good morning. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Bye.